Kings chapter 19 this morning. And just to give a little bit of background, in chapter 18 here, if you know you don't know the story very well, is where Elijah, he went to King Ahab and told him to go and get the 450 prophets of Baal and brought them, you know, told him to get the best young bullock they had and he would get his best. And, you know, they would put it on a sacrifice and he said, you call unto your gods and, you know, if they bring the fire, then, you know, I'll believe that your gods are real. And then he said, you know, if that doesn't work, then I'll call unto my God and, you know, show you that he's real. So they did this and, you know, the prophets of Baal, they cried out and cried out all day and nothing ever happened. And then Elijah, you know, he got his chance and he poured the water over it. He made it you know, to where this situation was as impossible as it could possibly get. And, you know, like Brother Daniel always says, God doesn't just make it difficult. He makes it impossible so that he can get all the glory out of the miracle when he performs it. And then God comes through and, you know, fills it with fire. And Elijah thanks him for it and all this. So Elijah, he is on this mountaintop, you know, probably the greatest miracle in his whole ministry, you know, to this point. And so we'll start reading in verse 1 and go through 18. And it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose for, and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither into a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him. And he said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Abba, Mahola, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room, and it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, and all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Let us pray this morning. God, we come before you, Lord. Oh, God, stand in need, Lord. God, I can't do it without you this morning. God, I pray right now. God, would you help me, Lord, to preach it, Lord. God, everything that you've given to me. God, I pray right now, would you encourage your people, Lord, this morning. God, we need to hear from you, Lord. We stand in need of you, Lord. God, we come before you, Lord, this morning, desperate, Lord. Oh, God, with a word from you, Lord. God, I pray right now. God, would you encourage us, Lord. God, encourage your people. Lord, show us what we need to see this morning, Lord. God, would you open our eyes, Lord. God, give us that strength to keep going forward, Lord. Oh, God, we'll thank you, Lord. 
Oh, God, everything that's done, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, with the help of the Lord this morning, I'll be preaching, you know, on the thought, deliverance from the stress. And the first thing we see here in verse 1 through 2 is the discouragement. Really, verse 1 through 8, the discouragement that Elijah faces, you know, when Jezebel tells him that, you know, whatever you did to my prophets, I'm going to come and do to you even worse. So the first thing we see here is the attack in verse 1 and 2. So Elijah, like I was telling you before on the background, this is, he's on the mountaintop here, probably the greatest victory in his whole ministry. And right after that, right when he comes down off that mountaintop, right when he gets over that victory is when the, the adversary here, Jezebel, attacks him the devil's going to attack us you know at your weakest moment and that is right after the victory one thing i've noticed in my life is that after those greatest victories you know is when the devil comes at you the hardest he attacks you know with everything he has because he knows you're in that vulnerable spot you know you get your eyes off of you know being focused on attack the devil attacking all the time because you know when you're seeking after something you know you're always your eyes You know, they're focused on what the devil could do. But when God gives you that victory, it gives you that peace. You kind of lose sight of that. And that's when the devil is going to try to come after us. And his primary goal, you know, is to drag you off the mountain that you're on. And we see here with Elijah after verse 1 and 2 in verse 3 and 4 is the anxiety that he faces here. And it says, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But... He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So what the devil is going to try to do to us, he's going to discourage us and get us to that point of anxiety. And I know in my life, you know, when the devil gets you to that place, you start doubting everything. You doubt everything that God's done for you. You know, that victory had just happened in his life, but... The devil got him to that place that he was so discouraged that he couldn't even see that. What the devil's going to try to do to us is get our eyes distracted, you know, off of what God has already done for us because that's how he can get us to that place, you know, where we're discouraged, disheartened, and, you know, don't really want to go forward. Elijah, he said, you know, I just want to give up. I can't do it anymore. You know, after he saw the greatest miracle that, you know, God had ever showed him, through his ministry so we see the anxiety and the attack but then also the affirmation here you know where God comes through in verse 5 through 8 and it says and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree behold then an angel touched him and said unto him arise and eat and he looked and behold there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head and he did eat and drink and laid him down again And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and nights into the mount of Horeb. So he's going through all this anxiety, all these attacks, you know, from the devil. But then this is where God comes through and gives him that affirmation. He gives him that encouragement, you know, that it's okay that, you know, he gives him that calm in the storm, so to speak, you know, when he doesn't want to keep going you know he's doubting everything God comes through and helps us because you know God loves us we're his children he doesn't want us to be in those places he doesn't want us to be discouraged you know he wants us to be going after his will doing things for him and you know just have that courage to keep going and a lot of people you know they see here they might think you know well Elijah went from this man of confidence you know to a coward here he went and ran but really you know Elijah here he was exhausted from the battle that he just won you know all the energy the time and energy he put into all that you know when we're doing things for God it takes a lot out of us you know if you do it the right way you know especially with something like the revival if you pour everything you have into it you know you pour your heart and soul to it you're going to be exhausted and then right after that you know that's when the devil's going to come in he said you know I've got him now he's in that place where he's exhausted you know he can't really think and that's where you know we have to do like Elijah here just kind of you know, try to get away from that and just take a moment to recharge. That's what he's doing, you know, when he flees. He's going to where God is because, you know, he realizes here that he can't do it by himself. If he tried to fight Jezebel right then, there's no way he could have won because, you know, he didn't have the strength to do it. And he also, you know, didn't have that word from God. So that's what he's going to see. So after the discouragement here, we see the 
desperation in verse 9 and 10. And he came hither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with a sword. And I, even only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So here he gets to that spot of desperation. You know, he says, God, I've tried everything I can do. You know, I've tried to get the people of Israel to turn back to you, but, you know, I just, I can't do it anymore. If you don't intervene here, you know, there's no hope for them. That's where you have to get in our lives that desperation, you know, for God to move in our lives, for God to save sinners, you know, for God to show the lost, you know, to convict them and things like that. And that desperation, you know, that's what God wants to see from us. God knew what Elijah was doing there. He knew why he came to him, but he's like, you know, Elijah, what are you doing here? And, you know, he just wants us to show him, you know, what he already knows. So we see the discouragement, the desperation, and then the discernment here in 11 through 13. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire but the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire a still small voice and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in mantle and went out and stood there entering a cave so here you know, you see the discernment that Elijah has. He sees these three things, the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. You know, these things that he discerns that they're not God. You know, it says there that the Lord was not in all three of those things. And that discernment in our life, the first thing it comes from is God's word. You know, we have to know God's word to know, you know, if it's from God. And, you know, the question you have to ask yourself is when these things come, you know, you see these visions you see these things well I think that might be God and you know the question you have to ask yourselves is does what you're hearing align with God's word you know that has to be the first thing that we ask ourselves because God's word helps us discern whether it's God or whether it's you know Satan trying to speak to us and get us confused and we must know God's word to know his patterns so we see God's word but then also God's ways you know what is God's voice sound like and Elijah knew that it was God's voice because he had a close he had that close relationship with him you know if we want to know what God's voice is we have to be walking close to him because I believe you know Elijah right here he was in the will of God he was doing what God wanted him to do you know he was seeking God's face and that helped him you know to discern that voice so you see God's word God's ways and then you know also like I was already kind of got into is God's will You know, we have to be in the will of God if we want to be able to clearly hear his voice. You know, we can't discern if it's God's voice if we're out of God's will. You know, we have to get to that place. And if you're, you know, if you're out of God's will, you have to realize that and, you know, repent and get back in God's will so you can, you know, so he can give you that direction to get out of that situation. And if you, I believe if you truly seek after God, he will make his will clear to you. Right. You know, he's not the author of confusion. He wants to make it clear to you. He wanted Elijah, you know, to get help here. And all Elijah had to do is, you know, exactly what he did here, just desperately seek after him, realize that he cannot do it on his own. So we see the discouragement, the desperation, the discernment, and then Lastly, hear the direction in verse 15 through 17. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abba shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that... Him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. So the first thing we see here when God has given him this direction is that it's very specific. When God, you know, gives you discernment on something, he will also give that direction on what you're supposed to do with it. And it is always very specific. You know, when the devil's trying to tell you things, it's very vague, and, you know, he doesn't really give you a specific direction, but when God gives it, you know, he'll make it specific that way that you know it's from him. You know, that way that it gives you that peace of knowing it's from God. And it's, 
specific, but it's also very serious, you know, the direction that God gives you because being out of the will of God is a very serious thing. And if he's given you that, you know, it's for a reason. He wants you to prosper. He's given you that way out of the valley or out of the storm, whatever you're in. Elijah here, you know, he was very discouraged, very disheartened, and God's given him the this direction to have a way out, you know, to have a way to where he can be successful here with what he's doing. So you, it's very specific, very serious, but it's also successful. You know, God's not going to lead you to failure. He's not going to lead you down the wrong path. If God gives you a direction, you know, he's setting you up for success. The only way that we can have failure through that is if, you know, we get out of God's will, if we step off of that path. And for every battle, you know, God gives us the direction to the victory. You know, everything that we're going through, you know, how no matter how bad it seems, God will always give you a way out of that. He will give you that direction, you know, <clears throat> through that. And so really here in concluding, the last verse I want to read here is 18. And, you know, this is the really the encouragement here for this morning. And it says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, and all the knees which have bowed unto Baal, in every mouth which hath not kissed him. So God here, you know, he's reaffirming Elijah here. Back two or three times, Elijah says, you know, I, even I, only am left. He feels here like he's the only one left. He's the only one left in Israel serving God. You know, he thinks that he's the only one trying to, you know, do God's will and do what God wants him to do. But God reaffirms it here. You know, he gives him that encouragement. He says, you know, there's 7,000 over here you know, that I haven't told you about yet. And I think, you know, God waited until that point to tell Elijah because he had to, you know, let him go through that trial, go through that battle to see, you know, how much he really trusted God before he could give him that encouragement there at the end, you know, that there's 7,000 people there left. And, you know, I think that's one of the main reasons that we come to church to know that, you know, there's other people serving God with you. You don't have to be in it alone. You know, you can look around the building this morning, there's, you know, 40, 50, 60 people, however many it is, you know, really trying to do the will of God, you know, trying to serve God to their best ability, and that encourages us. You know, I, I think that's why, you know, we need church. That's why it's important in your life because you can't do this thing alone. You know, you can't go out and try to do it alone. You need that encouragement. You know, you need that group behind you supporting you, praying for you. And, you know, so that's really... What I'll leave you with, and this last thing I'll say, you know, one thing that uh, Brother Heath always says is if all we have is God and each other, you know, I think we'll be just fine this morning. So I'll turn it back over to Brother Luke.